With no break today, because I have his presentation loaded up on my own computer, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Joseph Welsh. He's a founding member and treasurer of the Greater Lehigh Valley chapter of the ACLU of Pennsylvania. That's the American Civil Liberties Union. He also serves on the state board and the executive committee of the state board of the ACLU PA. A native of Easton, Mr. Welsh holds a BA in government, summa cum laude, from Lehigh University and a JD from Northwestern University School of Law. I think I've heard of those places. He has spent decades managing political and social issue campaigns and has served as a consultant to state and local governments. His work on issues has earned him awards from the US Department of Justice, the local media, and the ACLU. Mr. Welsh currently is employed as a consulting counsel for civil rights litigation at Lauer and Fulmer PC in Easton. Uh, please give a warm LVH welcome to Joe Welsh. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> while he's moving around the equipment, I'll just give you a disclaimer. Uh, I'm speaking today, I'm a state board member of ACLU. I'm speaking about ACLU, but a lot of what I say is really my personal beliefs, so I don't want them attributed to the organization as an official position of the organization. Um, also, by way of uh, full disclosure, I was uh, born into a Roman Catholic family, and um, our family sort of split with the church in the 1960s. I had two uh, older draft age brothers, and we heard one sermon too many about the Christian duty to be bombing Vietnam. Um, so I've moved away from organized religions. I have some personal beliefs about the nature of the universe, but. I think I need to get into this. What I want to do today is talk a little bit about the history of ACLU um, and the environment, uh, structural environment that we operate in trying to secure uh, all sorts of liberty and rights for people, uh, religious uh, liberty being one of the most important. ACLU was founded um, almost 100 years ago by a group of people who were reacting to one of the many red scares that we've had in the country. And this was right after World War I. This was right after the Russian Revolution and people were being rounded up, you know, with no uh, basis to believe they had committed a crime, they were being mistreated. So a group of people got together and formed a union to try to protect civil liberties, which became the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, <coughs> over the years, uh, we've weighed in on a lot of issues um, weighed in on some unpopular ones. Uh, as an example, shortly after we were founded, we went out and we recruited a biology teacher by the name of John Scopes um, and ended up partnering, partnering with Clarence Darrow uh, to defend Mr. Scopes for the crime of teaching evolution in Tennessee. Uh, we also were very active during World War II um, trying to fight the internment of Japanese Americans. In 1954, we partnered with the NAACP in the Brown versus Board of Education decision uh, starting the process of school desegregation. In 1973, we were involved in Roe versus Wade and Doe, Doe versus Bolton. Um, and we, in 2003, expanded some of the privacy rights that were established um, in Roe by uh, having the Supreme Court strike down a Texas law making sexual intimacy between same-sex couples a crime. Um, one of our more controversial uh, actions was we defended the rights of the American Nazi Party 
to march in Skokie, Illinois. Uh, Skokie is a suburb of Chicago. It is a very Jewish suburb. Obviously, it was chosen to be provocative, but we do believe that everyone has certain fundamental rights, including the right to demonstrate and advocate something that uh, we may absolutely consider to be abhorrent. Um, if anybody ever saw the movie, The American President, uh, there's a great speech about the ACLU at the end of that movie. That movie was made in the early 1990s, and it was uh, coming on the heels of the Dukakis campaign, where there was some issue about who was a card-carrying member of the ACLU. And Michael Douglas, uh, playing the role of the, pre the incumbent president, makes a great speech at the end of that movie about the ACLU, and basically tells his opponent, yes, I am a card-carrying member, and the real question is, why aren't you? <laughs> and explains the role the ACLU plays. It's, it, it's just a great scene, which uh, a lot of our staff loves that movie. Um, when we were organized back in the 1920s, amazingly enough, there had not been a single United States Supreme Court decision upholding freedom of speech. That has all evolved within the last hundred years uh, during our existence. Now, we're, we're about protecting civil liberties, but the core of the civil liberties that we protect is really the First Amendment. And there's a reason why the First Amendment is the First Amendment. It lays out certain specific basic rights that, that people in the United States of America should have. And of course, at the top of that list is freedom of religion. There's two aspects to freedom of religion. There is freedom to practice your religion, and there is freedom from religion being foisted on you by a government. And I'm going to concentrate most today on the second prong of that. Um, those values in the First Amendment the, the main purpose of those values is to create um, a discussion in the country. The same way that we've got an economy that's market driven, we look to the marketplace to come up with the most efficient ways to deliver goods and services. In the same way, our development of public policy is the result of a marketplace of ideas. And if we aren't free to talk about things, to publish what we think about things, to worship and use the values that people get from certain forms of worship and put those into the mix of the ideas, including values that people have outside of religion and their own personal beliefs, that all goes into a marketplace of ideas. And if everything is working well, those ideas are respected and they are discussed. And out of all of that discussion, we should come up with the best public policy possible. Now, there are lots of things that go wrong along the way. Uh, one of them is the influence of money and campaign contributions. So I'm not saying that we're anywhere near nirvana here, but that is the theory behind all of those freedoms, that they are there to ensure that ideas are brought forth that can find a better way to run our society. Part and parcel to that, part and parcel to that is the concept of diversity. If everybody's the same, you're not going to get a lot of different ideas out there, are you? You're going to hear the same thing. So hand in hand with this notion of a marketplace of ideas and 
getting and, and, and everyone free and having access to speak what they believe in is the notion that we need different ideas. And that's where diversity comes in. And of course, that is the thing that distinguishes the United States from a lot of other countries in that we are the melting pot. And we have, for most of our existence, it's gone up and down, but most of our existence, we have welcomed people to our country. And we have a statue. And I understand that the poem on the statue came a couple of years after the statue. I couldn't quite figure out what that meant. Um, but we have a statue that embodies that. Now, America was also found on the concept of religious liberty. And we had a wonderful uh, uh, song on that. 1620, the pilgrims see the new world. They set up a colony. Now, they're fleeing religious tyranny, but they weren't so happy about other people's religious beliefs. But it's a start. It's a start. They're at least fleeing something, and they're saying religious liberty matters whether we actually practice it or not. It's, it's something nice to have. So what happens, we fought a war against the monarchy. So we had a bunch of fairly bright people who um, wanted to set up a new form of government. But they had 13 different states. So they weren't sure how to do that. And we played around with the Articles of Confederation, which was like a loose grouping of the 13 states, and then realized, yeah, maybe we don't want a king, but we need something more central than what we have. So the states got together and ratified a constitution that gave us a central government of limited explicit powers. And all of the residual power stayed with the states. And within that central government, we split up the power between three branches. And that's often called separation of powers. When it's really working right, it should be sharing of power. That hasn't been happening too much lately. But the idea is if you spread various powers over various parts of the government, no one person can accumulate too much power. Uh, and the final part of that ordered liberty that we set up was the Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights was originally to protect the states and the people from this central government that had been set up. And as we'll see in a moment, uh, the First Amendment is written, Congress shall make no law. It says nothing about the states, but we will get to that in a little bit. Now, the way this all evolved, we issued a Declaration of Independence basically saying to uh, arguably the most powerful man in the world, but certainly one of the most powerful, uh, that basically we don't want you around anymore. And it, it, there was incredible arrogance in that document, but it laid out various reasons. The first draft of that document the Declaration of Independence, laid out as one of the crimes against the king that he supported the slave trade. Well, that became a big problem for certain southern colonies. And so slavery, the, the allegation about slavery was taken out of the final draft of the Declaration of Independence. And I often refer to that as, a, as the time bomb that was left in the Declaration. Because ultimately, that leads us to the Civil War, and we start changing the way we're looking at who's protecting liberty in the country. When the Constitution was ratified, the theory behind it was that our greatest protectors of liberty were going to be the state legislators. So 
they did all kinds of things, like they picked a group of people who decide who should be the president of this sort of weak federal government. That is the evolution of the Electoral College. It was originally the state legislators who were picking these electors. And I know people, people look at the election results, particularly the last one, and say this is absurd. But this is the origin of it. It was rooted in the notion that the state legislators were going to protect us. Um, that didn't work so well for lots of citizens, and they tended to be darker skin color. State legislators weren't doing much to protect um, blacks in the South. And by the way, in a lot of places, blacks in the North, too. This is not a real North-South issue, but it's, it did lead to the Civil War. What happened after the Civil War is we passed a series of constitutional amendments and what they did was they took this whole notion that the states were going to protect us from this federal government and basically stood it on its head and said, no, no, no. The federal government is now going to start protecting its citizens, the state citizens from their state legislators. The second thing that happened along the line was in 1913 when the income tax amendment was passed. That gave tremendous powers to the federal government to venture into things that they had not ventured into before. A great example is seatbelt laws. Does the federal government regulate motor vehicles or do the states? States? Okay. Federal government passes a law that says everybody has to wear a seatbelt. They have no power to do that, right? That's up to the states. So instead, what they do is they say, we have this thing called the Highway Trust Fund. And your state is slated to get $6 billion next year for roads. But if you don't pass a seatbelt law, you won't get that. Now suddenly, as a practical matter, the federal government is regulating motor vehicles. So those, those are the trends and how we've moved from a system where we expect the state legislators to be our protectors uh, to one where we look increasingly, and certainly the story of my lifetime, look almost exclusively to the federal government to be protecting civil liberties. Um, one of the other trends that's going on through all of this is more and more responsibility is being taken away from the state legislators and given to the people. And a good example of that is the 17th Amendment, which provided for the direct election of United States senators. Prior to that, some states still had the state legislators appointing the senators. So they were appointing the electors to elect the president, they were appointing the members of the Senate. And I, I recently saw a story, which I thought was kind of amusing. Uh, a, one Republican official was saying, the problem and the reason why we can't get things done in the Senate is we never should have passed that 17th Amendment. And I'm thinking, well, now that's a cute argument. Because Republicans overwhelmingly control state legislatures. So of course they would rather have the state legislators picking them than the people electing them. Which, interestingly, that comment, and this is not an issue that ACLU is very heavily involved in, but that comment really brings out the notion of how gerrymandered state, um, state representative districts are. Because you're saying, if we have this election at large statewide, well, the other party gets elected. But we overwhelmingly control these state legislatures. Well, how can that be? If the state's electing the other party, how do you control the legislature? It tells you that there's something wrong with the way the districts are drawn.
All right, so that's the framework that we operate in. That's how all of this liberty and power and, and what I like to think of as access points to government or pressure points uh, may be better. That's the background that we as an organization, that those are the cards we're dealt and that's, that's what we deal with. Uh, as I said, ACLU was founded in 1920 uh, in response to uh, one of the Red uh, Scares. And then 1925, one of our f first major issues was the Scopes trial. Uh, today we've grown, and I think this slide's a little bit out of date, I think we're now up around 1.8 million members. We have had a tremendous influx of membership since last November. Um, the the membership of ACLU between last November and this spring tripled, tripled. Locally, our chapter, um, we would normally have a turnout of maybe six or eight people a month. You know, wrote, you know some people can make it one month, some people can't, you, I'm sure have the same, uh, the same situation. We now are routinely getting between 20 and 30 people a month. It's, it's just phenomenal. Um, it's gratifying to me that when liberty was challenged, people knew where to turn. And that, that made a lot of us feel good. Amazingly, the ACLU only has 300 staff attorneys nationwide. So how do we do all this stuff? Well, we do it in, in two important ways. We have many, many, many people who are volunteer attorneys. And many law firms, some of the major law firms in Pennsylvania, um, Deckard Price and Rhodes, uh, Pepper Hamilton, many others, Reed Smith, that give not only their personnel, but also their infrastructure to assist us in what we do. And almost every major case that we bring there is a private law partner with us. Uh, and beyond that, we partner with a lot of other organizations who are more, usually more issue specific. Um, so as we'll see, in some cases, we partner with the Americans for Separation of Church and State. Um, in voting rights issues, we partner with, uh, among others, the League of Women Voters. Um, and uh, many other organizations. Anyway, this was one of our first big ones. Uh, you might recognize this from the movie Inherit the Wind. It was all which last night. It was, yes. It was, I saw it was on last night. Um, anyway, uh, great movie if anybody hasn't seen it just outside of the issue. Um, as I said, the background to this was uh, Mr. Scopes was a biology teacher who taught this thing called evolution to all the God-fearing people of Tennessee. And that didn't go over too well. And Colonel Potter there was the judge, by the way. Yeah. All right. So what's really at stake in religious liberty? It's the ability to believe and practice your faith or believe and practice nothing by way of faith. And what's interesting is if you look at the way the amendment was constructed, and I said before, First Amendment, there's a reason why it's the First Amendment. But if you break it down further, what's the first thing in the First Amendment? It's religious freedoms. But if you break it down even further, what's the first thing within religious freedom? It's the establishment of a religion by the government. That was considered more important than even the free exercise of religion. And that's a point that a lot of people don't seem to quite understand. Now, as I say, we've spent uh, almost a century 
facing the, the challenge of preserving religious liberty for uh, everyone in this country. And basically, it, there are four main areas that we're involved in. The first is uh, government promoting religion. And that's a whole bunch of things like opening public meetings with a particular prayer or um, um, put it pushing, as in the Scopes trial, that a particular religious viewpoint needs to be part of the curriculum. Um, religion in the public schools, things like prayer in school, that's, that's a perennial one that comes up. Like, when all else fails and there's nothing else to complain about, then somebody comes along with the, why aren't we saying prayers in school? And we have that debate for the 1,000th time. Uh, something that we've been involved in that's, that's becoming much more important um, is the use of religion as a way to discriminate. And you see that, uh, for example, in uh, refusing to uh, give services to LGBT couples. Um, you also see it in the context of health benefits and uh, some pharmacies that were actually refusing to give birth control. The, the theory behind that is that if it's, a, if it's a small business that's sort of like a sole proprietorship, uh, well, their religious freedom means that they can't do these things that are repugnant to them. The problem with that is if you're now not just an individual, you're an entity in the marketplace. So do you want to be in a marketplace or not? If you want to be selling certain things in the marketplace, you really can't be picking and choosing based on your personal beliefs. Um, and then finally, the, the free exercise of a religion. And the best example of that recently is the Muslim ban. We're going to keep them out. Some of the current national issues, and I mean really current, in North Carolina, the uh, county government their county commissioner meetings, would start with, I guess, a rotating commissioner. It was in Rowan County, North Carolina. I'm sorry, did I? Yeah, North Carolina. Um, they would start with one of the county commissioners saying a prayer. Well, there's two problems with this. The one problem is all the county commissioners were Christians, so the only prayers that were ever said were Christian prayers. But the second problem is you can't really have a government official starting a meeting with a prayer. That is obviously the government establishing a religion. What has been allowed in the cases is you can, on a rotating basis, invite someone, including a humanist, to come in and say some words at the beginning of a meeting. Or you can have a moment of silence. Um, interestingly, the Fourth Circuit, which is not one of the most liberal circuits in the country, uh, they, they first they ruled against uh, the county, and then the county appealed it. That was a three-judge panel then the county appealed it to all of the judges of the Fourth Circuit. And they upheld the original decision. And in, that, in their decision, they said, the great promise of the Establishment Clause is that religion will not operate as an instrument of division in our nation. That kind of nails it. Because every place that religion has been um, placed into politics. It has been there solely for the purpose of division. Which is why we had the Establishment Clause in the first place. Now the other issue which has just come up involves political contributions 
by churches and political involvement by churches. And this has always been an issue, uh, at least in my lifetime. And it starts in 1954, there was an amendment passed called the Johnson Amendment, which says that if you are a tax-preferred organization, known as a 501c3, and I'll explain that in a minute, you cannot engage in political activity. Well, now there's a proposal that you can, sort of. Um, first of all, does everybody know what a 501c3 is? All right, 501c3 is a reference to a section in the Internal Revenue Code, and it covers nonprofits. And 501, there's a whole bunch of 501c organizations. Um, some of them are political groups, some of them are labor unions, all sorts of things. But to be a 501c3, you have to have a religious or charitable purpose and meet the various tests for that and get certified by the Internal Revenue Service as a 501c3. Then, when people contribute to you, not only is your income not taxed, but when people contribute to you, they can take a tax deduction for contributing to you. And that's why organizations want to have a 501c3 status, because that is determinative. I write out a check to a 501c3, like the American Civil Liberties Union Foundation, and I get immediately to take that on my tax returns. I don't have to prove to the IRS that this is a charitable organization, and it really fit the definition. So that's, that's why 501c3s are important. Churches are 501c3s. What has been proposed and is in, the, um, is in one of the budget bills uh, for next year's budget is a ban on the IRS investigating if a 501c3 is doing political activity. You can imagine the result. I go, I contribute to my church, I get to write off the tax deduction, and my church takes the money and puts out a mailing for a political candidate, okay? If I don't belong to a church and I just directly contribute to a political campaign, I don't get to deduct that. See the problem? Uh, we have, uh, the ACLU nationally, have uh, written a letter to the House Committee on Appropriations that's considering this and voiced our strong objection. What you can do to help is you can call your local representatives and tell them this is a really bad idea and have your voices heard. Now, th those are um, two issues that are occurring nationally. Some of the issues that ACLU of Pennsylvania has been involved in in the recent past uh, include prayers at government meetings. We just, um, this was back in 2015. The uh, Council of the Borough of Monroeville, just outside of Pittsburgh, started every meeting with the Lord's Prayer. And uh, we sent them a letter. We do a lot of letters. <laughs> we sent them a letter, and lo and behold, uh, their lawyers looked at it and said, you know, it's probably not a good idea. So that was, that was an easy win. Although I actually, when I was researching some of this stuff for today's talk, I saw a newspaper article that now apparently some ministers in the community are coming to the council meetings and in the public comment period, getting up and saying prayers. <laughs> it's like, okay, really? Um, 
Another interesting issue that we've addressed is certain, when you register a corporation or a business name, certain words will be caught by the Department of State's computers. So if you register a business that has the name Christ or Jesus, it, the computer kicks it out. And someone looks at it to determine whether you are got a business name that's blasphemous. Interestingly, if you put the name Allah or Muhammad in your business, the computer did not kick that out. Um, anyway, that was an easy win in federal court, to the extent that any win is easy. Um, the judge uh, who struck that down noted that blasphemy laws have historically been used to persecute those with minority religious beliefs, including William Penn. Uh, a, a perennial favorite is religious displays on public property. Okay. One of our latest was in Luzerne County. And what we did was we sent a letter. <laughs> okay? And we laid out all the legal reasons and the Supreme Court cases why you can't do that. And lo and behold, a week later, Luzerne County agrees to remove them. Um, and I have to sort of stop here for a second and tell you, I've been on this state board for three years. And for most of those three years, I had the privilege of serving with a woman by the name of Rosalind Littman, who is a, was a lawyer from the Pittsburgh area. Um, she graduated from law school in 1952 and established a law practice, later established it with her husband. Um, she almost immediately became a volunteer lawyer for ACLU, one of those private lawyers that helps out in cases. Her big case was on Allegheny County property, there was a large crash display. And people came to her and she ended up doing the case took the case all the way to the United States Supreme Court and won and established the precedent that we rely on in places like Luzerne County when the issue comes up. Rosalind passed away this past year and um, it's a loss to our organization, it's a loss to everybody who cares about liberty, but I thought she deserved mention on this issue. Um, then we have things like intelligent design, and we're going to get into this a lot more in a moment. That I, I like to refer to intelligent design as the evolution of the Scopes trial. Um, and, and I'll have more to say on that in a minute. And one of the things that we did, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, generally about how we're responding to things, uh, on the weekend that uh, Muslim Ban 1.0 was announced, ACLU lawyers nationally were in court in New York. We and other affiliates around the country took that decision from New York and immediately went to local federal judges to get it enforced at various places like Philadelphia Airport, where a number of people were being detained. In fact, one of our lawyers, Molly Tack Hooper, one of our staff attorneys, who was actually out on maternity leave, came in to handle that issue and had her, I think it was five week old uh, child with her and strapped to her while she was arguing for the, uh, for the freedom for the detainees in the Philadelphia airport. We're kind of committed to this stuff. <laughs> um, anyway, intelligent design. This is, this is really interesting. The intelligent design notion arose after 1987. You didn't hear about intelligent design before 1987, did you? You heard about creationism. 
That's what you heard about. The reason intelligent design pops up after 1987 is this. The Supreme Court rules the teaching of creationism is unconstitutional because you're teaching a religious belief in the public schools. All right? Well, one school district in Dover, in the middle district in Pennsylvania, came out with textbooks teaching intelligent design. We, uh, we sued in the middle district. And just so you know, there's three federal court districts. There is the eastern district that's basically centered in southeast Pennsylvania. It's from Lehigh Valley south to uh, Philadelphia. There is the western district, which is from Pittsburgh and north. And then the middle district, which is the middle of the state. Now, people who follow politics in this state, you might have heard of Pennsylvania being referred to as Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and the T. The, right, that's, that's another phrase for it. Um, anyway, so we're in the middle district. We were in front of a, a judge who's, uh, I think, one of the most fascinating judges I've had some personal experience in cases with him. Uh, he's got a conservative background. He was very close to uh, Governor Tom Ridge and ended up being appointed judge by uh, President Bush. But he's, he's, he's a really thoughtful guy. He's incredibly witty. He writes some of the, the funniest opinions to read. But anyway, he, uh, he heard... Uh, unbelievable amounts of testimony on this and ruled in our favor that intelligent design was just a replacement for creationism and creationism is a religious belief that cannot be taught in a public school. By the way, it was also Judge Jones who decided the gay marriage case. And we in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania ACLU, had a gay marriage decision before the United States Supreme Court issued its decision. Um, and I, I just want to note, because uh, I said this before, in that case, we, Vic Walchak, our legal director, uh, was uh, doing this case on behalf of us, but he was also partnered with Eric Rothschild and Stephen Harvey of Pepper Hamilton in Philadelphia, which is a, a, a firm that's consistently been with us in court. And we also um, were assisted by Richard uh, Katsky, who is the assistant legal director uh, um, at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. So that, this is a case where we partnered with other organizations and we partnered with private attorneys. And that's like the model of how we get things done. Now I told you, and I hope this is legible, I told you that um, basically everything flipped in the late 1980s and creationism became intelligent design. These are, we, we put on expert testimony and these are excerpts from textbooks. And over here you've got a 1986 textbook uh, titled Biology and Creation, where creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator. Okay? Then we go to a uh, new book, Biology and Origins. Creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator. Then they switched the title of the book to Of Pandas and People. That's, that's, pandas are nice, you know. <laughs> um, so they switched it to pandas, pandas and People. And here we have creation means that various forms of life began abruptly through the agency of an intelligent creator. 
But then we morph it by 1993 to intelligent design means that various forms of light began abruptly through an intelligent agency. See, no creation, no creator, just an intelligent agency. Okay? That didn't wash with Judge Jones. This one's really interesting. The top slide here, these are textbooks, and they start in 1983 and run here through 1993. The red line on the top one is the number of times the word creationism was used, and the blue line is the number of times the phrase intelligent design was used. And on the second one, it's a similar count. The red line is the word creation, and the blue line is the word design. Now, even if you're not a great chart person, can somebody look at that chart and tell me when the Supreme Court case happened? Yeah. Think you can do that? Anyway, that, that's the kind of evidence that you need to present when you're trying to convince a federal court um, to uphold religious freedom or basically any other freedom. In fact, you, you might remember with Brown versus Board of Education, um, one of the pieces of evidence that was relied upon by the courts was uh, the Dahl test which was a test of how uh, children were responding to dolls of different colors. And it was part of the scientific evidence basis for the Brown decision on the destructive nature of segregation. All right, so those are the kinds of things we do. Those are particularly things we do with regard to religious liberty. The way in which we do our work has changed, and it's recently taken on a dramatic change. Classically, the function of ACLU was somebody, some government does something to somebody that violates the Constitution, whether it's freedom of speech, freedom of the press less so, um, obviously freedom of religion, um, issues involving uh, criminal defendants' rights, issues involving discrimination, something would happen somewhere. People would come to us and say there's a problem. We would then go to court. And that's the classic ACLU model. You bring us a problem, we look at it, we say, you know what? This is a serious problem. And so we use your situation as the vehicle to raise this issue in the courts. That's classic ACLU work. By the way, just so you know, ACLU of Pennsylvania, we get, I believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 inquiries a year. We take on 100 cases. So we have to be very selective and we look at whether the situation involves a, a fundamental constitutional right and also whether it's something that involves a large, larger number of people because we're trying to get the greatest impact for the work we do. And by the way, that count of 100 cases, some of those are the ones where we just write a letter. The, the actual cases that we actually take to court and litigate is a very small number. And as I said, we get somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 inquiries. All right, so that's, that's the typical model down through the years. What we've done over the last maybe decade or two is that we've supplemented a lot of that with public education and outreach. So we take, we take these issues to the public and we make the public aware of things. And it's something that in Pennsylvania, the local chapters do a lot of work with. Um, people like me go out and talk about this stuff. So we try to educate people about issues. Um, I did a lot of that with the voter ID uh, law several years ago, which we successfully overturned. Um, 
so we do that. And also outreach of trying to get people involved and letting people know about things um, let, and, and encouraging them to have their voices heard, as I did with the case of the uh, church contributions to politics. It, part, part of it is just letting people know what's going on and encouraging you to respond to it. Now, one concept that we found very successful in the voter ID case, and everybody know about the voter ID case? It was, it, it was basically a plan that everybody has to have an ID when they go to vote. And it, there were only certain classes of ID that were acceptable. Lots of people say, well, what's wrong with that? I have an ID for lots of things. Well, the problem with it is that there, there literally were counties in Pennsylvania where there wasn't a single PennDOT office for anybody to go to. So there was a tremendous burden put on it. There was an issue about people who changed their names like they got married. And there was an issue of a lot of older people who were not driving and didn't really have the ability to get to a place to get an ID. In the end, Pennsylvania state government admitted admitted in court that as many as 600,000 Pennsylvanians would have been disenfranchised. Well, we, we successfully blocked that law. Um, one of the ways that we did was legal storytelling. Uh, this, is a, this is a concept that our state president, Tracy McCants Lewis, who's a professor at Duquesne Law, uh, has very much encourages of going out and explaining to people the, all of the issues behind what we're arguing in court. Letting people hear the story, the individual stories, like the individual plaintiffs in, this, in the voter ID case how they were being uh, affected, how much of a hardship it was for them to get an ID, and basically go out and just tell the story. What, what is this case about? Why does it affect large numbers of people? Why should I care about it? And so that's something that we've been employing more and more. Now, the biggest departure from our traditional model happened this year. We launched a new initiative called People Power. The idea behind People Power is to have uh, grassroots organizations locally to work on issues. And I'll get into People Power a little bit more. But this is an entirely new area for us. We have never been involved in grassroots organizing. And, um, you know, it's it's a work in progress, and we're waiting to see the results. But it, it almost became inevitable, because as I told you, we had this massive influx of new members. And a lot of those new members said, I want to volunteer for the ACLU. And the thought from the national organization was, well, we don't want to tell these people, drive down to Philadelphia and you know, put stamps on envelopes for us. That's not really meaningful participation. So what People Power is trying to do is to give projects to people that they can actually go in their own communities and deal with things on a local level. The first project was called the Freedom Cities Initiative. And what, what happened with that is throughout the country, groups of people went and met with their local officials, their local police officials, to determine exactly how they would interact with immigration, federal immigration officials. What information they would or would not share, what assistance they would or would not give. And um, we got a tremendous amount of data back. And even locally, I was a little surprised at um, some of the departments that said, no, we're not part of the immigration enforcement. That is a federal function. We don't want our officers involved. And uh, it, was, um, it was interesting to see how, how, how the reactions came back from uh, people who met with various uh, local officials. Needless to say, in Allentown, Allentown has very much been a, an immigrant-friendly city. So there, were, there was no real issues uh, with respect to the city of Allentown. So those, those are the ways we do our work. And obviously, we had a challenge to civil liberties that happened last November. 
and is ongoing. And after the election, Anthony Romero, our uh, national executive director, laid out some guidelines as to how we were going to function. We knew the challenge was coming, but how we were going to function. And his first rule was that we were not going to speculate on what might happen. We, we would prepare, second rule, we prepare, we knew Muslim ban, that was kind of like obvious, but we would prepare for these things and be ready to go when the challenge arose. In the case of the original rollout of, of Muslim ban, it was clear our lawyers were better prepared than the government lawyers on the weekend that the ban went into effect. And that's why we were able to get a lot of quick initial, uh, initial success. And the final thing that we've decided is that we do not take a position on appointments. The president can appoint whoever they want. However, if we've had experience with the person, we'll tell you what our history with that person is, and we'll point you to sources of further information. But we don't officially uh, approve or, or oppose uh, a nomination. And there's actually a historical basis for that. It goes back to um, Mr. Bork, mm -hmm. who you may recall from the, uh, the Saturday Night Massacre, which everybody's been educated on recently. So we feel that we are meeting a lot of the challenges. We certainly nationally um, successfully responded to the Muslim ban. Um, I told you about the Philadelphia airport detainees, which our affiliate in Pennsylvania was able to deal with. And um, locally, we've been dealing with um, a couple of issues. We, there was an, uh, an Allentown family, and the name escapes me at the moment, but there's an Allentown family that had been split on the weekend of that Muslim ban, and we successfully um, worked with uh, Congressman Charlie Dent to get them reunited. Um, and then we've had an ongoing battle with the Lancaster School District, which um, has been uh, settled now, where immigrant children of a certain age were being put in a punitive academy as opposed to being mainlined in the school system. And we were able to uh, convince uh, Judge Smith in Easton that that was a violation of federal law. And it was kind of, I went down for part of the trial and it was kind of interesting. And it, it, it just shows you how the arrogance of some people in elected or appointed positions in government can get them into trouble. Judge Smith laid out, it was a, it was a hearing on an injunction, so the judge got to ask questions too. And after the attorneys had finished, Judge Smith started asking questions of the superintendent of the school district. And he said to her, you know, the plaintiffs are suing under this very powerful federal law that gives the court a lot of power, and they're asking for this, this, and this. And he went down the list. And he said, you know, I think you can give them this. I guess you don't want to give them this. You don't want to give them this. You don't want to give them this. And he finally, when he finished that and asking her about each aspect of what we were asking them to do, when he finally finished it, he looked at her and he said, you know, these sound reasonable. Why is it that you don't want to, you don't want to uh, uh, agree to this and instead want me to, they, they want me to order it and that might happen. I'm not sure which way I'm going to decide. But why would you want to put yourself in a position where a federal court's going to have to order you to comply with the law? And this woman looked right at him, looking at a federal judge now, and said, well, we believe that the Lancaster School District Board is the sole and exclusive agency to decide what is appropriate for our children. And I, I've known Judge Smith for years. Uh, he just sort of like, he just sort of like leaned back in his chair and said, well, all right then. 
<laughs> anyway. So, as I said, uh, People Power is this new initiative. And the way it fits into things, it, it gave us something meaningful to have people do. Uh, one, of the, one of the more recent People Power events in this area was um, an event called Cooking with a Hyphen. It seems like we're hyphenated Americans. There's Turkish Americans, African Americans, um, Indian Americans. We have all these sort of hyphenated divisions between people. And the, uh, the theory behind it, and this comes from our national political director, is that food tends to bring people together. So at the end of June, we had a cooking with a hyphen food event in downtown Allentown where all sorts of diverse people came and brought uh, various uh, foods for people to eat and got to know each other and we brought people together that way. As I said, we've had people going to local, um, local elected officials and, and police chiefs. That goes back to that whole notion that I started with about the distribution of power between the, the central federal government and states and municipalities. And so what we're trying to do is affect federal policy by dealing with it on the local level and getting enough local officials to say, I don't want to be a part of this, and basically push back against um, things that the federal agencies are trying to do. So finally, what can you do? Well, there's a couple of things. Um, I'm gonna have a sign-up sheet. If anyone is not on our email list, um, if you give us your name and email, we will put you on. Don't panic. Okay, we send out we send out like a weekly newsletter saying these are the issues we're working on, and we'll occasionally send out something if there's something important enough that you need to know about it right away. We are not one of these groups that sends you an email at 10 o'clock in the morning, and then at noon says, "Didn't you read our 10 o'clock email?" It's like, no, we don't do that, and and we try to provide a lot of substantive uh, information. So that's the first thing. Second thing you could do is join ACLU, which you can do at uh, aclupa.org. Um, if you'd like to get involved in our local chapter, we meet the second Thursday of every month at 7 o'clock at the Unitarian Church at Center and Wall Streets in Bethlehem. And I welcome you all to come to our next meeting Thursday night. And finally, if if you want to get involved with People Power, uh, you, if you go to uh, the website peoplepower.org, um, you can sign up to volunteer for one of the People Power projects. That's my uh, prepared remarks. I would be very happy to answer questions. As usual, we're microphone for questions so that they can be captured on the video. Um, <coughs> when you ask your question, hang on to it in case there's some follow-up dialogue. And I will get it around. We'll start with Ed. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I travel around quite a bit, and there seems to be a godless, hedonist, Manhattanite that so many people in rural America seem to adore. And how is this affecting uh, the ACLU? Because I noticed in this country the division between urban and rural is becoming much more divided than ever before. And I, I never saw so much antagonism in so many rural places in Pennsylvania and upstate New York uh, against civil liberties. And uh, it, it really kind of scares me what the division of this country, uh, you know, where, where things are going. And I don't know how the ACLU can help heal this division because Essentially, it doesn't seem to preach to the people that seem to have you know, the most issues against civil liberties. You know, it's funny. Um, 
and this is my personal view on things, but I felt that when Barack Obama was president, that there actually were many opportunities for us to interface on liberties issues with more conservative groups because they didn't like the guy who was president. Um, one area, though, th there are a lot of places where we do uh, work with uh, conservative uh, legislators. And one of the prime areas is on civil asset forfeiture. Are you all familiar with that? Ba basically where you're not guilty of a crime, but the government, usually the local police force, uh, takes property that it claims is somehow connected to that crime that they can't prove you committed. Um, it is a big issue with conservatives as well as uh, liberals. So that's an issue that, that we've been able to build bridges on. And I think there, there are a number of other issues in that regard. As far as the, the absolute knee-jerk uh, support the president hardcore, probably not. They would probably see the ACLU as something that you know, doesn't serve their interests. Um, and I, I mean, that's always going to be the case. There's always going to be uh, certain levels of people who will blindly uh, follow someone. Richard Nixon, on the day he left office, had a 22% approval rating. So you know, th there's, there's always going to be a core out there. But we try as much as possible to build coalitions um, that do not, uh, do not reflect the, uh, the potential politics or the, the political background of the people who are working on a specific issue. We're very, very focused on working on specific issues. And people who may hate us for a whole bunch of other reasons, still we have enough credibility as an organization that they'll work with us on a common interest like civil asset forfeiture. So we're trying. Martha. I have a question that I've wondered about for a long time about the uh, voter ID laws. I'm not supporting them here, but what I'm saying, what I'm thinking is, do you ever consider sending people out to get people those IDs, like the voter registration in the South, which got people registered to vote? We, we're, ACLU is actually two organizations. We're, the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a 501c4, not a c3, and then we are the foundation, which is the tax deductible organization, which is a c3. Um, we have done some limited voter work, and we're pretty much limited to communicating with our own members. We just, last election cycle, um, did a demonstration project that was looked at nationally on uh, mobilizing ACLU members to get out and vote on election day. And I don't, I don't think there's an answer on to whether it had an impact on the results or not. We were not endorsing any candidate. The candidate that won is a former civil rights lawyer, so you would think that uh, ACLU members were probably leaning in that direction, but you can't tell. Um, so we, we've, we're making some forays in that. But as far as going out and actually getting uh, IDs for people, that's something that we're not in a position to do. We, we just simply would not have the staff to do that. Um, there are other service agencies you know, who may do that, um, and we partner with them on the legal issues. but. You know, our core mission really is getting the legal precedents established and letting people know what's going on and, and lobbying on a legislative basis. If whoever does it, I think it would be a way to knock these things down forever. Well, that's right. That's right. I think I saw a hand up front here. Joyce. Have, have you been involved at all in the um, insurance problems like the Hobby Lobby, where we have companies that are refusing to carry insurance that would support uh, abortion or even contraception in some cases because of their supposed religious... Uh, right. 
pay. Yeah. In the meantime, the people who work for them can't access health care services. Have you been involved right. with that at all? Um, ACLU nationally has been involved. It's, not getting very far. <laughs> well, I, I know, and and of course, it's now all completely up in the air. We we did take a position, and this is a little bit unusual for us. We did take a position on um, the Affordable Care Act repeal, and we did that on because we usually look for if we're going to take on an issue, where is the civil liberties component to it, and. Basically, the reason that we weighed in on, on ACA was that there are a lot of anti-discrimination provisions within the Affordable Care Act that would be wiped out by most of the alternative proposals if anybody ever puts one together. Um, but obviously, that was part of what was being targeted. So, on, so that was the civil liberties issue um, that we took our position on ACA with. A question from Michael in the back over here. Hi, thanks. Um, I was wondering if you had had any experiences in, and what your opinion um, is with uh, Satanists. I can't. I can't uh, think of one off the top of my head. I would assume that somewhere in the country. We probably, at some point, dealt with it. Yeah, didn't they do one in, uh, I'm sorry, in, in uh, Phoenix, the city? They, they want to do a satanic invocation there. I thought the ACLU's got involved in that, but... It, it sounds like something we get involved in. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah the, um, uh, religious statues on federal property or um, religious literature in schools, some causes that different Satanist organizations have gotten in with. I don't know if there hasn't been any local um, worshiping. Yeah, I don't. I, I yeah, I, I don't know of anything locally. I want to. I want to kind of add to those comments, and I don't know if this is the group that, that Michael's talking about specifically. There's there's a group of Satanists called the Satanic Temple, um, and I know they're not the only game in town, at least in the U.S. But they are actually a bunch of atheists who do their activism in the form of Satanism. So, um, for instance, like he said, giving invocations, um, but when they talk about the specifics of it, aside from proclaiming Hail Satan at the end, it's all, you know, using compassion and reason and upholding uh, personal freedoms and, and liberties and that kind of thing. Um, and then they can do some effective activism. Um, they, in schools where they've handed out, you know, Bibles and religious literature, um, and the defense has been, well, we would allow other religions to hand that out as well. They had this Satanist coloring and activity book that they passed out in the elementary schools, which is actually, when you break it down, promotes a lot of good things and positive values. So I just wanted to mention that for the benefit of um, everybody here. We're not talking about people that are making blood sacrifices and things like that. So uh, we had a hand right over here, Eve. Yeah, I'm... Uh been keeping up on that uh, cross thing down in uh, Pensacola where they erected a giant cross on public property and I understand there was a, a ruling on it which was then appealed. Do you, are you aware of any of that? I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular okay. uh, case. Evidently they, uh, there was an order to take it down by a judge who reluctantly told them that. Right. And then they appealed and they got the support of some group who is going to pay all their legal bills so they can leave it up. So I, I'm just not sure what's going on there. and You're not aware of that. Then. No, I'm not aware of that, but I, I can't imagine a federal appellate court saying, oh, yeah, that's okay. That, that's, that's, just, that's just so far removed from you know, any plausible argument. Uh, if there's a, an attorney from the Amer American Humanist Association, Monica Miller, who I think was working on that, so you might be able to find some things on their website. Um, but this was a good leeway into a, a question regarding, you said um, you only take on about 100 um, actions or cases out of 20,000 complaints that are made. Is that in Pennsylvania or was that, that that's in, in Pennsylvania? That's in Pennsylvania. Yeah. So um, for the ones you can't take, do you ever refer them out or, or advise other organizations? Um, 
and, and this is a good example, the American, Human Associ the American Humanist Association, who does have a legal arm, who follows up on these kind of things. Also the Freedom From Religion Foundation, as well as American Atheists. I, I don't know if you ever partner with those organizations or refer those kind of complaints out. I, I, I would think that if we saw something that we thought had significant impact that for whatever reasons we didn't have the resources to handle, uh, we would do that. We, as I say, we certainly partner with a wide variety of organizations. Great. So. Any other questions for Joe? Okay, Tony. Um, how would you say a person's freedom of religion should be expressed, if it's possible? Um, there was a, well, anyway, how, how would you say they sh would be legitimately and justice, justifiable? Well, a, a person's freedom of religion, including the freedom to not have a religion, is something that, one, may not be interfered with by the government, and two, needs to be protected by the government. So, as an example, you can't go around uh, blowing up mosques. Oh, and there's a lot of hate rhetoric out there that I'm sure inspires such things. But the government cannot be foisting a religion on someone, nor can they be infringing on someone's right to practice their religion. Those are the two basic tenets. So in line with that, um, I was thinking, uh, what, was, what would be the ACLU stance on uh, like polygamous groups in, in Utah or other things that don't necessarily have any harm to anyone else, but their right to practice that specific belief is being hindered? The, there, there has to, there, there's some certain legal thresholds that are recognized by the courts with respect to religion. And part of it is if it is an established religion and how, people, how many adherents, or not, not necessarily how many, but whether people are really adhering to the faith. This was an issue, um, I, I, don't, I don't recall seeing anything on polygamy, but this was an issue back in the 60s with Native American tribes and the use of peyote. Um, and they, their right to do that was upheld at the time. I think that's been eroded somewhat, as, as I recall. I saw a hand over here. Were you, uh, was the ACLU uh, getting involved like when the president was setting up his commission wanting like to know our voting records from the states? And um, um, you know, the, the possibility I, that you know, our right to a private vote is in jeopardy then? Yes, uh, I, g I gave a speech on that outside of Senator Toomey's office two weeks ago. <laughs> on a you. Tuesday, no less. <laughs> yeah, there's, we, we have gone to court on that on, on a statutory uh, basis. And I'm trying to reconstruct everything in my head at the moment. But essentially, the way in which the commission was set up violates a federal law with respect to uh, advisory commissions and it violated it on, on notions of transparency. Um, they weren't keeping minutes of their meetings. They weren't making the meetings available to the public. They were holding uh, the meetings in the executive office building, which requires pre-clearance by the Secret Service to enter the building. So it wasn't a public venue by any means. They were having private uh, phone conferences so there's a whole host of issues um, involving transparency, but there is also uh, a major issue involving the composition of the commission. There is a requirement when a presidential advisory commission is created that its membership reflects various viewpoints on a subject. And in the case of this commission, Every single person who was placed on it, and I th there have been some recent appointments, but every single person who was placed on it initially had taken a very public stand, and in many cases had lost in the federal courts on the public stands they took to disenfranchise voters. And then I think he put people on who basically didn't have any experience, so, hey, 
Nobody ever said they did anything wrong. They never did anything. <laughs> um, but, but nobody uh, representing you know, a viewpoint that, that what they're talking about is disenfranchising or, or heaven forbid, like maybe expanding the opportunity to vote. So that's our other ground, our uh, other ground for attacking it is the actual composition. And also that once an advisory, presidential advisory commission is set up under the law, certain steps have to be taken to insulate it from the administration that set it up. It is supposed to function. I mean, the whole idea behind these things was we get a whole bunch of experts together about something we don't know anything about and they have different viewpoints and they hash it out and then we get some kind of consensus. Right? That's not how this commission is functioning and that's why we're in court opposing it. And that's the best I can do from memory. If I had my notes, I could tell you the stellar records of some of these people. Okay. Um, folks, those of you who are staying for lunch, the, the food should be here very soon. Um, I've got some change. If you need to pay me, I would say like $7, $8 would be a good number if you're getting in on the, on the pizza and salad. I know some people have paid Kate already. Um, but since we are still waiting, are there any final questions for Joe? Great. Well, thank you again. For, oh, oh, there is. Very good. How, what do you do with a situation like Melania Trump, who reads the Lord's Prayer? What can you do? I mean, she is a private citizen, yet she's the first lady, and just roll well, your eyes, she, or what can we do? Yeah, she's, she's free to express her opinions as long as she's not do Well, she, in particular, does not have a governmental role. Um, but... If she were doing that in the context of a public meeting, um, like the, the meetings that we've talked about, with the, starting with the Lord's Prayer, that kind of thing, yeah, then there's an issue. But for her to say, oh, she believes in God, and, okay, whatever. You, you believe in God, but uh, you know, you'll throw people off health care. Right. And Donald Trump didn't know she was going to do that. <laughs> Do you think that anything happens in that family that Donald Trump doesn't know of ahead of time? I don't. I really don't. But that's my personal opinion, not the belief, not the position of the All right, any final questions? All right, any final questions for Joe before we break up? Yeah, over here, Barb. I wasn't going to waste time on this either, but since we seem to have time. <laughs> Um, I have a question about this real ID thing. Uh, I'm not sure I understand it to begin with, and now I guess Pennsylvania is, is still kind of on the, on the fence about it. Um, can you enlighten me a little bit? I know it's something to do with the Patriot Act, but I don't, what is it? Oh, and, the, air, the air travel? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's one aspect. Uh, it, it came out of the Patriot Act, and it was to have more secure IDs, and um, I, I don't know what the current status of it is, but at one point there were going to be biometric identifiers on the IDs, and, and we certainly opposed it on uh, privacy issues. What's happening now is that the states are just simply being blackmailed, um, you know, and, and being told that... Uh, that their citizens will not be able to board airplanes, that kind of thing, if they don't pass the real ID law. But that's actually, to go back to that earlier question, that's actually one where we partnered with some very conservative people um, who did not want real ID to take effect. So. I would think. <laughs> okay, we do have to get set up. Um, so we are gonna the break now. But join me uh, in one last time thanking Joe for coming today. All right, we're well, gonna... certainly, certainly thank you for having me. There's nothing I'd rather talk about than civil liberties. Very good. <laughs>